Today we'll be looking at rasters in Python. And if you want to follow along, make sure to download the module five data zip file that you see there. So just recalling the structure of a raster is different than that of a vector later. So we've been looking at vector layer and vector data so far, points, lines, and polygons. Rasters, however, fill up space. So whatever space is being registered has or is full of cells. And they have columns across the top here and rows like so. And columns and rows have indexes just like a spreadsheet. So for example, we could say, we could say A, B, C, D, and that should say B here, E, F, and then label them here to A, B, C, D, E, F. But most of the time we don't have this type of naming convention for rasters. Instead, we just have zero, zero, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, like that. So zero, zero, the top left is the coordinate of the first cell. Zero, one would be this cell. Zero, two, this cell, zero, three there. 0, 4, 0, 5, and then 1, 1, or 3, 0, 3, 4, et cetera. And that's how we can address or get the index values for a particular cell. So this one example would be 3 and 3. That's actually the fourth, remember? So if you actually count 1, 2, 3, 4, because everything starts at 0 in the cell address system. Then once we put a raster layer into a GIS system or as a spatial data layer, it also has for each cell a real world coordinate in some coordinate system. And the coordinate system will have the smallest coordinate values in the bottom left corner. So the cell at the bottom left corner has the smallest coordinate values. So that would be the origin of the projected or Cartesian system. Most rasters will be in a Cartesian plane like that. So that one unit of X and one unit of Y are the same thing. So when a Cartesian system is two dimensional, and so one unit of X and one unit of Y are the same thing. That's different from, let's say, the orthogonal or what we call a globe here. I'll put the equator there. Not a very good globe, but in a 3D system like longitude latitude, of course, the meridians converge at the poles. I'll draw that better, but you get the idea here that one unit of X here, that could be one degree right there and one degree near the pole have very different physical distances in a three-dimensional system like longitude, latitude. And so we don't generally work with rasters that are in a, or I should say a longitude, latitude system or a geographic coordinate system. Rasters are usually projected into a Cartesian system using a map projection so that they then have this rectilinear quality and orthogonal quality. And every unit of X is equal to a unit of Y. And in a Cartesian plane, of course, the origin is zero, zero. And so the bottom left cell here will have a value the value in the raster for the Cartesian system, which is closest to zero, zero. It won't actually be zero, zero here. It depends on the projection units that come out. So it could look like something like that, 2389, for example, in some sort of system. And so every raster has two coordinate systems 
a internal coordinate system called the cell address system. So the column and row system, and then for every cell, also a Cartesian or projected coordinate in the real world. At the intersection of a column and row in a raster, we have a value. The value doesn't mean anything numeric. So this doesn't mean numeric. So the word value is often um, associated with numbers, but values can be non-numeric as well. They can be strings, for example. A string is a value. Um, an integer is a value. A floating point is a value. And so the cells can have different types of values in them. Some have numeric meaning for certain types of thematic layers, let's say like, land, like elevation, for example, or temperature. They can be measured with real numbers. So something which is continuous. And you can also have cells that represent some kind of thing, like say like land use where the numbers will still be here, but they represent codes like two equals forest. And five means water. So a cell with a f the fives in it here would just be a region of water. So the numbers that are within cells as values, will always be numbers. And we have to know that some numbers have numeric meaning and it all depends on the theme of the raster. So you have to know whether or not those numbers can be treated numerically or not, because all rasters have numbers where a column and row intersect and they're called a value. But sometimes the numbers are just representative of different kinds of things, not real numbers. Why is that important? Well, because not all operations are appropriate for certain types of values. For example, if we have land use, well, we can't, we shouldn't, we can, but we shouldn't. Let's look, say, or ask the computer to look up, well, what's the average land use? It'll compute it because it just sees numbers. It doesn't say, hey, those numbers don't and should not be interpreted numerically. So we have to know that ourselves as experts in the use of spatial data. And cells can also have integers or floating point numbers in them, things with decimals. And generally, 99.99% of the time, if there's an integer, then it could possibly be a categorical raster. That means something where the numbers have no numeric meaning. They show differences of kind. So a categorical raster. Just means categories. That could be, and then it could use numbers like 1, 10, 57, 9, 0, 6 to represent different classes of things. And Python, ArcPy, they don't know that those aren't real numbers. And they'll just go ahead and treat them as real numbers if you do certain things with them. And often, whatever you get out, like if you ask for things like averages, maximums, minimums, standard deviations, whatever. Uh, they have no actual meaning in reality. Only when we have a continuous, a continuous field. So a continuous field variable is something where the numbers have numeric meaning. And they could be integers or floating point numbers. So just seeing integers doesn't mean you have a categorical raster because you can also hold continuous uh, data in uh, integers as well. So in ArcPy, we can start by looking at how to list rasters. The first thing um, is setting a workspace. And then as you saw in um, 
the previous exercises, you learned the list functions like list rasters. And that'll list all raster objects in a workspace. We could also specify what type of rasters we want to have listed. So let's say uh, list all ra raster objects that are of type JPG, JPEG. So that's called the JPEG. So that's just what it's called. So JPG or JPEG. That's another format for, these are the same, same uh, it could be JPG or JPEG as the file extension. And that's one type of raster data, a lossy type. So it's a type of raster data that will not keep the original numbers um, when you convert to that particular format. It's not a good format for GIS in other words, but we can still list them with as a raster because they are rasters. And the, a lot of the pictures you see on the internet are JPEGs in web pages. Let's have a look at listing some of them. My um, uh, Pi scripter window, and I'll say import artpy. That always takes a second. I'll say from artpy import env, since we need to set our environments. I'll say env.workspace equals, and I'm in my case here, I put everything in C, temp, Sierra, Nevada, dot GDB, like so. Then I'll hold my list of rasters, our list, and I'll say arcpy dot list rasters, like so, to just to list everything. And then I'll print that. And I'll run it. And we can see down in the console, we have elevation, land cover, ownership, and soil. So those are the rasters that are in that geo database that I can work with. There are no specific JPEGs or anything in there because JPEGs would be outside of the geo database. Let's say if I just said C temp, for example, C temp. And I just comment out the rest of that database. I can still list rasters and print them because there might be other rasters in there, which are just images and stuff. There's a whole bunch of them in there that are fine, not too many. Some of these are satellite imagery, some are other things. So TIFF, TIFF is another type of image format. It's different from JPEG in that TIFF can be a non lossy format. Non-lossy means that the data, the values in the cells will not be modified when you save a TIFF file. And so it's a common exchange format for raster layers in GIS and remote sensing for that reason. Whereas JPEG, every time you save it or modify it, it changes the actual pixel values, the cell values, which you don't want to ever have happen with data. Um, that you're supposed to do something with. If it's just for show as a background or a picture, it doesn't matter. But generally, TIFF is a good format. And PNG is another good one too. Portable networks graphics, portable network graphics, PNG. Let's say I just wanted to see ones that were TIFF. Well, I could say list rasters like so. And I could say, there we go. None and uh, TIFF. I'll run it here like so. And so now it only shows me the TIFF files. So if I wanted a list of all TIFF rasters of that format, well, I can get it that way using the list rasters function. So it's one of the basic functions. And I'll go back up here to my uh, Sierra Nevada and rerun that. So we just see those things there. Elevation, land cover, ownership, and soil. And notice that there's no extension on these because in a geo database, we don't have file extensions because they're part of the geo database itself. So elevation is stored in the geo database, land cover, ownership, and soil are geo database rasters. Raster properties 
are exist or do exist for any raster object. So if you have a raster object, you can have raster properties such as all of these right here, which tell us things about the raster, like the format, whether it has a rat, that's a raster attribute table. And those exist only when we have integer level rasters. So rasters that hold integers in their cells because those are the types of rasters that are used to represent categorical data. And so you can have a attribute table associated with the cell values, which simply are numbers that represent differences in category. So, and they can have attributes kind of like vector data has an attribute table. It's kind of the raster equivalent of vector data. Height, extent, compression type. So what compression algorithm is being used? Where it is, the catalog path, the band count. So how many bands are there? So a band uh, can be one band. That's an image that has simply a set of numbers in the cells, or it could be multiple bands all the way to infinity, potentially. So that in the same file you have, in, for the same cell locations, multiple values across a number of bands. Usually this is in remote sensing where you can have um, red, green, blue for visible parts of the spectrum. But then depending on the sensors you're using, you can have other bands of electromagnetic um, light recorded. So things like short wave infrared, long wave infrared, or shortwave ultraviolet, for example, on the other end and stuff like that. And so you could have a multi-band image and you can check out if you have a multi-band image by looking at the band count. And all you have to do is once you have a raster object, then you just say raster object dot property. And how do we get a raster object? Well, we have to go and tell something to be a raster. Also notice here that there's a save method that's a method on a raster, which you just put in parentheses a new name in quotes, and we'll see the save frequently um, in that you can save any raster you create, any raster variable using save, and then the name of giving it a name, and it will put it in the default geodatabase. So all of these can come from a describe object on a raster as well, so either one. How do we specify something as a raster? Well, we have to say, use the raster function. So in ArcGIS, there's a raster function, and that creates a raster object in Python. Like here, ras equals arcpy.raster, land cover. And land cover obviously is a raster in the geodatabase. And this makes it into a Python raster object right there. And once we have that, we can get different properties or apply methods to that particular layer or manipulate that layer as a variable in equations like map algebra equations, for example. Just having a look at that over here, if we go back to, I don't need that raster list anymore, so I'm just gonna remove it for now. And I'll use elevation to start with. I'll call, I'll say that's a lev, and that's equal to arcpy.raster and then elevation. And it's probably better to have that as a variable. So I can change that whenever I want. So I'll say um, rasvar equals elevation. And I can get rid of it in here and just use a variable. Ras name is better for that. So ras underscore name, and I'll put the underscore back in here using the Python. Um, notation. So now LF, when I run this, like so, LF now is a raster variable. So if I look at, let's say just down in the console here, and I'll move it up a bit so we can see it. I'll just clear it. So I'm starting at the top. So I'll say LF type LF. 
And that says this is the of the class ArcPy spatial analyst raster raster. Like so. So type lev. I'll just clear that. Type lev just to check out what it is. So lev dot and look at all of the sudden sets of properties we have here that we can use. So there's some methods and methods look like um, export image. They have little icons with um, a moving thing to say that they're methods. So um, you can kind of visually see the difference between them. And like, there's just so many of them, isn't there? So for example, here, that's to do something with the rat. I've not used that one before. Is it, you know, read only, for example, we can say that. And that's true. So this raster is read only right now. Elev dot uh, band count one. So it's a single band raster. And usually thematic rasters are single band rasters. Thematic raster meaning that it has one variable that's being shown in the raster. Elev meaning elevation. Elev dot, you can get extent and that'll return an extent object. Like so, so dot. Um, extent dot, see what we have here. We have our X min, Y min, X max, Y max. So X max, for example, that's the maximum X coordinate for this raster. And you could get then the, the maximum, the minimum X and Y coordinates to know what the actual extent of the raster is if you wanted to, just by these properties. Elev dot, other common ones, catalog path. Well, there it is. So that's the path to that raster. And those are all given or available once you have a raster variable. So just by the sake of saying arcpy.raster, and as long as what you send here is a real raster layer, you'll have all those properties and methods to work with. Um, further examples here, all the properties can also be acquired on a describe object. So you can also describe a raster. So here's our raster variable. We can describe it here using the describe function and just have a description DESC variable there, which is a describe object. And here we can get things like the data set type. Is it permanent or is it a temporary raster? And these, this can be important to check out because you may want to have code that's processing a number of different rasters. And by default, raster variables aren't permanent. So you can always check if it's permanent first. And then if it is permanent, then call the save method on the raster to make it, um, if it's not permanent, to make it permanent, call that. Then um, for single band images, we can say, okay, if the band count is one, then we could look at things like the table type. See, there's a table there. And even the primary field in the table. So when we have a single band image or a raster, we can check or we can ask about its table type. So looking at elevation, for example, I'm just going here. I could say, okay, elev dot, I don't have table type here. I'll have to get the describe object. So DESC to check some of these things equals arcpy.describe elev. Once I have the describe object, I can check things like that. I can say print, and I'll just print them here. DESC dot table. That won't come out. Table type, like so. And the table type is a value table. I can check the primary field, print that out as well. And it's just zero. So the primary field is value. That's all that's in there. If instead I looked at the a different one, like the land use, run that land cover. It also has a not, there's no primary field in it. And it just has a value table. Now, what's most important though about working with rasters is not that you can get properties from them. That's those properties are useful in many circumstances that you need to get them. However, much more important is the controlling environment for raster analysis. So we have workspace, 
output coordinate system, processing extent, snap raster, cell size, and analysis mask. And when you're working with more than one raster, you must set these. When working with more than one raster. Why? Because these are critical environment settings that determine the output and what the output rasters will conform to when you're using input rasters and doing things together with those rasters, such as overlays or other raster analyses, which we'll see some examples of. So the workspace obviously is set. We have to set that when we're in Python. The output coordinate system. Now, this should be the same as any of the input rasters. Why? Because you don't input rasters into analysis that have different coordinate systems. You have to ensure that you have with rasters, and this is something you don't really think about a lot with vector data, but with rasters, the coordinate systems must be set using the project raster tool. So the project raster tool must be used on each of the input rasters if they are of different coordinate systems. And you can check that on the describe object by getting the spatial reference of the rasters. So for example, here in my geodatabase, I have a number of rasters. So if I, again, I say arcpy dot list rasters, elevation, land cover, ownership, and soil. And I wanna see if they all have the same coordinate system. So I say arcpy or I'll just say 11 equals raster arcpy dot raster 11. Elevation, ele no, elevation, elevation. And I can say elev dot spatial reference dot name. So that one is in NAD 27 UTM zone 10 north. Elevation. What about raster? Well, it becomes tedious, right? So why don't I just get a list and iterate over them printing those out? That makes more sense, I'll do that up here. So I'll get a list called RAS names by using my ArcPy list rasters, like so, now that's a list. Then I'll iterate over this list. I'll say for RAS in RAS names, create the raster variable, and I'll just call it X in here, equals ArcPy.raster RAS. So that's the name of the raster. Then what I want to print out is I want to print, not in capitals. I'll do it in two, two, more, two lines so it's easier to follow. So I want to get here the SR equals X dot spatial reference. And I'll print here SR dot name. Like so. Now I'll run that and that'll tell me whether or not any of these have a different coordinate system. And they don't. So all those rasters have the same coordinate system. What if I did that just for the temp folder? Remember the rasters that were in there? Let's check those coordinate systems out. So I'll just click comment here and then comment, and I'll run that like so. Um, supported. So there's one data set in there that uh, is not, cannot be supported as a raster. So it's listable as a raster, but not supported. So I'll, I'll set my list rasters here, none, and just the TIFF ones, like so. And there's so all the TIFF rasters, because some of the other rasters that it lists are just um, maybe corrupted or something, or they could be um, certain types of rasters, like I just download off the internet as a picture. It'll just be a picture with no coordinate system. But here you can see, for example, 
one of them is a NAT83 transverse Mercator. So a NAT83, that's probably a UTM type system. The other ones are WGS84 UTM. And so I can see here quickly that I have, you know, if I was to use all of these in the same analysis, I'd want to make sure that I transform this one from that coordinate system into this coordinate system prior to doing any analysis with the rasters. In the Sierra Nevada case, just going back up here and having it look at the Sierra Nevada ones, and I'll run that. And why isn't it printing anything? Uh, because there's no TIFFs in there. I have to take that out as well. In the geodatabase, they're all the same. The next thing is that they're all projected. So notice this is NAD27. That's the geographic coordinate system that was projected into the UTM zone 10 north. And UTM is a map projection. And so all of the rasters are already projected into the same coordinate system. So I could use them all together in an analysis. If, however, I had a list that looked like something like this here, where I have a different raster, well, then I'd have to use the project raster tool to convert this one into that spatial reference so that I could then use them in analysis together. For the, for the processing, for the workspace then, if we have more than one raster, we need to set that output coordinate system. We have to set the processing extent, snap raster cell size and analysis mass. So looking at these ones here, just the ones that are in the um, arcpy.list rasters, that are in the geodatabase here in Nevada, they all have the same coordinate system, so that's all right. And then I should set one of them or check maybe things like the cell sizes of each of these to see if they're the same. Oh, I could do mean cell width, for example. And I can just print that out here, SR. So I just modified my thing that was looking at coordinate systems to print out and I got the mean cell width or mean cell height because these are all square cells in these rasters. 99% of rasters you'll ever work with will have square cells. So just getting the height or width is fine for a cell. And then I'll print it out. Uh, they're all, and that says 30, 30, 30, 30. And we know that this is a UTM zone, so that's meters. So each of these is 30, uh, a cell that's just 30 meters by 30 meters. And each layer has the same cell size. So that's good. So now we can do some environment settings here. And I'll just go back up to the list rasters. And I'll get the first raster for the environment settings. You can check other things here too if you wanted to. You can check the extents to see if they match. Um, in this case, not all the extents match, but they're all in the same region. And we'll use then a control raster for these crucial environment settings. So we'll set these environment settings to match one of these rasters that are going into this analysis. So that any outputs that are created also have the same extent, cell size, coordinate system, et cetera. So it means I need to get, get one of the rasters. So up in my code here, I'll just say control raster equals arcpy dot list rasters zero. So that's the control raster. And we know zero in the list here is elevation. And we do it this way using the list rasters because, we, because we've already checked that they all have the same properties. So then I go back to my ENV here and I say ENV v dot snap raster equals control raster. ENV dot output coordinate system equals control raster. And I could put you know control raster like that. Um, but before 
sorry, I forgot what one thing to show you here. So I'll just remove those two I did. Um, this is just the raster name. So um, control raster name, that should be called. So control raster name, then I have to make actual raster variable in order to do the environment settings. So I'll call this control raster now. This equals arcpy.raster and then control raster name, like so. Now I can properly do those environment settings. So arc uh, env dot cell size. And I can set that equal to control raster. env dot extent equals control raster. env dot output coordinate system equals control raster. env dot snap raster, very important, equals control raster. env dot mask equals control raster, like so. So this set, and I'll just make this a bit smaller at the bottom. So we list the rasters just to get one of them because we've checked already that they all match and have the same coordinate system. So we take one of them to be the control raster. So to do that without um, using a raster name specifically, we could have used uh, the raster elevation by name in here if we wanted to, but we just did it this way because it's more automated. So we get the list of raster names. So then from the list of raster names, we get the first raster and we put it here, control raster name. And then we create a raster variable called control raster out of that by saying arcpy.raster control raster name. Then the environment settings of cell size, extent, output coordinate system, snap raster, and mask are all set to control raster like that. Now that that's done, any analyses we do will have rasters that exactly match the elevation raster or whatever the first raster is in the list of rasters. The cells will align, the extents will align, they'll have the same coordinate system and the same cell size, obviously, and shape as well because the mask is set here. So most of the time, this will be one of the rasters. So the same as one of the existing rasters undergoing analysis. Again, that's only useful if you first controlled for the coordinate system of all the rasters. They all must be in the same coordinate system and have the same cell size. And for cell size, if you have to change it, you would use the resample tool. So resample. Tool or ArcPy function called resample to change the cell size of a given raster. And it really depends on how much of a change in a cell size you have to do, but that's beyond what we're going to talk about, just about ArcPy with rasters and stuff you'd learn in the third year course. So here's another example of what, we just, what I just did. Uh, here, import the environment settings choose a raster, which we did. We did it differently, a second way. We did it here by name, just to have a raster variable. And then we set all of the raster um, environment settings to that variable. And we got the spatial reference like that. And that becomes there. Either way, you can set it to the raster or you can get the explicit spatial reference for the coordinate system. Our pi recognizes either as a valid output coordinate system. So if you just put the raster name there, instead of the spatial reference itself, like we're doing here for output coordinate system, um, you, can, you, can, you, you can discard this and just put the name RAS up here, like so. Either way works. So working with raster objects, working with raster objects, to do analysis requires the spatial analyst extension. And this means that we have to 
check that extension out to use it in ArcPy. So in ArcGIS or ArcGIS Pro, whichever one you prefer to use, you have to you have to enable extensions. So there's all kinds of extensions like Network Analyst you'd be familiar with, Spatial Analyst, Spatial Analyst, and the Spatial Analyst one is what allows us to work with rasters directly to use them as variables in map algebra statements and stuff. It's one of the ways. If you don't have Spatial Analyst license available, then you have to use all NumPy arrays, and we'll talk about those in a bit. So generally, when you're working with rasters. The first one of the first lines before you start doing anything with your raster variables will be this arcpy.check extension spatial, and you store that into a variable called extension licensed. And you would then have an if. If extension is licensed, then check out the extension spatial and then do code here under that if statement. And at the very end, check in the extension. Why is that important? Well, in limited license environments, like where you'd be working in the real world, not at the university, they may only have one or two licenses for an extension, like Spatial Analyst. And if you don't check that in afterwards, nobody can use that on the network anymore. So anybody that's using ArcGIS they wouldn't be able to use spatial analyst until you checked in the extension again. So you first check to see if it exists. Then if it's licensed, which not all organizations have, um, you check it out. And that then allows the code to use spatial analyst functions. And at the end, check it back in. Um, Want to do some stuff in after running a script or something, you might want to do some stuff in ArcGIS and you didn't check in the extension spatial, uh, then, that, then it's, it's still checked out and that can cause issues when you're trying to use it yourself. If you're in a limited licensed environment, we're not at the university, but uh, generally you want to learn how to work in a limited license environment. So going back to our code, what we would do here, um, and we, we don't need this one part here is now after setting our environment settings, we would say, okay, check ext for check extension, arcpy.check extension. And then the word here is spatial for spatial analyst. And then if check next, then check it out arcpy dot um, check out extension spatial and then at the very end down here somewhere check it in arcpy dot check in in extension spatial like so. So then all our code that we would do for analysis would be under this if block here. So if I run that now, nothing will happen, but it will have been checked out and checked back in. Like so. So that's the way to do it safely. Now in the examples that I'll be doing, I won't be having this everywhere just because it takes extra space and I wanna illustrate certain things but you should always have this in your own code so that you get used to using it this way, even though I'm not using it all the time for demonstration purposes. So saving raster objects. Again, I mentioned earlier that we have rasters and one of the raster variable methods is save and you have to give it a new name. And so whenever you want to have a permanent record of some output of raster analysis, for example, here, um, we have a raster variable called RAS, which is from land cover. We check to see if that's temporary. It'll say false. 
we do a operation like multiplying it by one, which is fine. Um, that's the only multiplication that's fine for a nominal level raster, a differences of kind, since it just returns the same values to each of the cells. So it's not changing anything. But in this case, that becomes a new RAS right here. And if we check whether that is temporary, that'll say true. Because it's a derived raster, it comes from a algebraic or map algebraic um, expression. RAS times one, right there. And that creates a new raster variable that can be used in analysis or for further computations or whatever. And it's temporary by default. So that will say true, as I mentioned. To make it on non-temporary, because let's say you want to keep it uh, permanent as a new raster, you have to save it. So you call the save method of the raster object. We can do this with our um, example with elevation, for example, over here. I'll do it in, in, in the extension checking part here. So I'll say, okay, um, make a raster variable uh, and it'll be for the elevation, we'll do it. So ras variable, I'll just call it ras equals arcpy.raster and I'll use elevation like so. Then I'll check to see, just to show you, I'll say print ras dot is temporary is temporary and that will say false because it's a permanent raster we we know what exists already in the geo database just to show you how it works and then i'll do something new i'll say output out ras so an output raster equals ras times 0 0.3048 this is a uh from the us this elevation so the elevation values for the cells are in feet and we multiply feet by 0 0.3048 to get meters. So the raster will have each cell multiplied by 0 0.3048 and that will be stored in outras. But that's a temporary. So now if I say print outras dot is temporary, that'll say false. So then I'll have to save it. So I'll say outras dot save, give it a new name. LF meters like so, and save it. And then I check in my extension. So let's run that. We'll see a true and a false show up here. So here we have false, that was the first one, that saying that, well, elevation is not temporary. Outras. Then we, we printed whether that's temporary and that's true. It is a temporary raster until we save it. So now if I do my, if I do a list and I'll just do that in the console down here, I'll just make that a little bit bigger for a second. I'll just clear my console and I'll say, okay, let's list the rasters, arcpy.list rasters. And we'll see our ours is in that same thing. So I'll have meters. There it is. So that new raster is now in the, our working geo database workspace as a permanently new raster with elevation in meters. And the, the only way that happened was by using the save method like we see here of the raster. Otherwise it would just exist temporarily. And once the script is finished running, it would be deleted. For raster analysis, we have a number of different things we can look at. First are just basic arithmetic operations between rasters. So in, these, in Python, we have these operators. So standard arithmetic ones plus division. We won't bother with integer division or modulos. You can look those up. Multiplication, power, subtraction, and we won't bother with the unary operators either. So those ones. So basic, you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and exponentiation. 
So those can all be used as operators. There are functional equivalents like plus. So in the spatial analyst toolbox, there's a function, ArcPy function called plus, one called divide, one called times, one called power, one called minus, and one called add, or plus up there, I should say. So there's two ways to do things. Now, the easiest way is to use basic operators here, things you're used to working with on a calculator, but using rasters as the variables of the things you're adding together. And what happens is when you use these, these are local operations, meaning that if there's more than one raster, then each cell will be multiplied by its corresponding cell at the same location in another raster if you're using multiplication. Or if you're using addition, each cell is added to the corresponding cell at the same location in another raster, which could be multiple pluses together. You could have 10 pluses if you wanted to. And out comes a new raster, which is the sum of the cells that were all in the same location. So it's called a per cell operation. We have relational operations as well, equal to, greater than, greater than, equal to, less than, less than, equal to, not equal to. So all of these are used frequently. And for example, you might want to create a Boolean layer and that's what happens. So Boolean layers are output where we have, again, a Boolean layer could be something like this. It just has two colors. One is, let's say the dark color is true and the light color is false. And these will be represented as ones or zeros on the raster because the cells have to have numeric values. So the number one means true. The number zero means false. And so whenever you use these, that's what you get is a raster output, which is Boolean. Then we have conditional operators, which are used with relational outputs to overlay to get different types of things. For example, um, you know, areas, find all areas of forests that are on slopes greater than 15 degrees. Well, that requires an and operator, that type of a question. So that conditional statement then will give you another Boolean layer at the other end which shows where both conditions are true. We have also the or, so and and or are the most used ones here. So or, I could say slopes greater than 15 degrees or forest. And so if a cell has either of those, it will become a one or true. If it has neither, it'll be false. And that would then be a new layer based on a conditional statement that uses relational operators. And we'll do some examples. So here's a simple example called a topoclimatic model. So topoclimatic modeling is the idea that as we go up in height, air temperature decreases. And if we're at height and we go to lower elevations, air temperature increases because of the um, the, it condenses more because of atmospheric pressure. So there's a, the idea of that is uh, encompassed in what we call a lapse rate. The lapse rate specifies how many degrees of change in temperature there are per meter. So how many temperature changes per meter? In this case, we can look at five degrees Celsius per meter as an example. So here we have 30 degrees, that's a sea level temperature. And then we have height in meters times the change, five degrees per 1000 meters. And that then converts to meters, which is 30 minus 0 0.005 
times the elevation or height in meters. And that can transform elevation through that process into temperature, like so. Into temperature, like so. As such, it's called a topoclimatic model. Going back over here, for example, it's pretty straightforward. We have a lot of the code already. So we have our elevation raster. We have outras, which we converted already to um, a temporary variable here, which is the um, elevation from feet to meters. And then we simply have to say, okay, 30 minus the lapse rate times this. So I'll take out these last two here. And I'm going to, instead of calling this outras, I'm just going to call it um, uh, temperature, like so. And that will be equal to 30 degrees minus 0 0.005 times that. Then I'll save it as temperature. I'll say temperature. Let's save, and then in parentheses here, uh, temperature. That'll be the name of the new raster. So notice here, I did all this in one step. I have parentheses here because parentheses always happen first in the order of operations. So whatever in parentheses will happen first. So the raster, RAS, which is elevation up here, right there. So RAS will be multiplied by 0 0.3048. Then that's multiplied by 0 0.005. Just because multipl multiplication comes before subtraction. And then whatever that result is, is subtracted from 30 to give us the new temperature. So running that now, and it goes very quickly. And I can check, I, I should take out of the code here, the um, temporary, print temporary makes it a bit smaller. We don't need that anymore. Looks like that. Now I'll look at my, to see if it was saved. I'll say, okay, arcpy.listrasters. And it should be temperature now as a layer in my geodatabase. And there it is, temperature. I could have used LF meters here instead of doing it in one statement, but I'm just showing you the power of map algebra to treat each cell of the raster as a variable in this equation. So this is just the example here. So we start with, in this case, up here, I make elevation. And when I make my raster variable, I multiply it by, by 0 0.3048 to turn it into meters. All those are set. Then we have our map algebra statement. Notice here, because I already have elevation in meters, I just have to say multiply by 0 0.005. And then 30 minus that. So whatever this is, is subtracted from 30 to give it the temperature. And then I save it. Just use a different name in my example. And of course, checked in the extension already in the code. Now, the other thing we can do, and this is kind of a, a way to copy rasters in a way. So let's say you want to apply the environment settings that you've set to a raster just to you know, have it clipped to the extent that you're working with. Let's say to have it clipped to the extent that you're working with, as well as the cell size and the snap raster and the coordinate system. Well, there is a spatial analyst function called apply environment. And you could apply that to any raster. And whatever the current environment settings are, 
will then be applied to that raster. So it's a basic way to copy a raster into the environment setting. So it, it uh, has the same extent, cell size, and shape of the other rasters. So it's a good thing to remember that. We're not, I won't bother doing an example because it's just a one-liner here, but that's a very handy thing that may come up for you in the future is to apply environment in order to make a copy of an existing raster uh, to match environment settings. So arcpy.sa now, the spatial analyst, so everything we've done so far, um, we don't need to have, uh, what well, we did need to have uh, spatial analyst checked out. So we had the spatial analyst checked out, but we did not have to um, import the spatial analyst uh, library of functions of ArcPy. Only when we want to do analysis with spatial analyst functions themselves do we need to have ArcPy data SA imported. And what I mean by that is if I go back to my code here, at the top where I have my imports, I would say from arcpy.sa import all. And that imports all of the spatial analyst functionality. Of course, it can only be used if spatial analyst is present and checked out. Now, this check-in check-out only matters in standalone scripts or programs like this. If I'm gonna be running this in a script tool, which we'll learn about in the coming weeks, then you don't have to bother checking out because checking in or out is done at the software level, not at the script level. And I'll explain that when we come to it. So importing the spatial analyst functions means bringing in all the ArcPy tool functions that you see in our toolbox for spatial analyst. ArcPy also has a number of classes particularly the arcpy.sa classes, so the spatial analyst classes that we're talking about here. We won't go through all of them, but I'll show you a couple uh, common ones. One common one is remap. So remap is a class that is used to define how we would reclassify a raster layer. So for example, you might have elevation and you want to create a ordinal ranking or an ordinal map of elevation, which is just from low, you know, medium or low, somewhat low, medium, somewhat high and high, for example. So when you want to do that, you have to remap or what we call reclassify. So we'll have a look at that one. It's an example of one of the classes of arcpy.sa. We'll also look at neighborhood functions which is are very common within um, use in ArcGIS. So it's one of the more used things are neighborhood functions or focal functions. And they require the class for neighborhoods that we see here, that these are things that we create instances of that don't by themselves do anything, but they are used in other ArcGIS spatial analyst functions. Here's an example. This is called a remap range. This is one of the remap functions or classes, remap range. And it's something you can apply to any given raster. All you have to set up are the specific new values that are based on the old values. And a range means, for example, here, take zero to 7,000 for some variable. We don't know what this variable is. You could pretend it's anything. So zero to 7,000 and reclassify any cells within that range as a one or 7,000 to 9,000 as a two. And the remap range and the remap functions look like this. They have as their arguments, to make it the instance of remap right here, they have a list of lists. So a list of list means that you have a outer list and then inside each component is a list itself. So that's one list component comma two. 
so one and two. So within a outer list, you have inner lists, which make up the um, instructions on how to change cell values from a continuous variable or categorical to a um, ordinal level, one, two, et cetera, three, four. And in doing so, the endpoint here, so zero to 7,000 is always included in that. So anything um, equal to zero all the way to 7,000 proper will be included in one. And then here, even though we repeat 7,000, that's a uh, open-ended, uh, you know, if you look at set notation down here, I give the full example. But what happens is we put the same number here and here, but ArcPy, ArcGIS, know that this means just above 7,000. So 7,000. 0 0.00000 whatever, one, two, 9,000 proper. So that looks like that open and that's a closed end. So it knows to do that. So you, you don't have to worry about, well, if I put 7,000 here and 7,000 here, what's gonna happen? It knows to go just over 7,000 for the second instance. So remap range is for continuous data. There's also remap value, which is used frequently. So remap value. So that's another one for that. And in that case, you have your old value and your new value in that list of lists. Let's say old value could be five and you want it to be one. And then another list over here, you know, uh, seven, comma two. So that, that's when you're asking for specific values or categories to be remain, renamed into new categories. Let's look at an example of just using that inside of ArcGIS, or not inside ArcGIS, but in, in uh, ArcPy. So here's our data so far, but we're still working with Sierra Nevada. Um, I'm just gonna run that. I'll remove the stuff from the uh, map algebra that we looked at, since we're not gonna redo that part. And what I'm interested in seeing there is just to get the list of existing rasters to see which ones I could do a remap value with. So I run that and then I'll just say RAS, oops just in my console, I'll just ask for the RAS dot names, RAS, RAS underscore names. So there's all the ones we have to work with elevation, for example. So we know elevation is continuous and we also have elevation in meters. So we could check those out and say, okay, uh, let's grab elevation in meters to do this with. So I'll do all my code under the, the checkout extension as we were doing before, still leaving that in there just for practice and you can see the structure. So, um, oh, I should go up here though. I'm gonna put above there or I could put it in there, it doesn't matter. I have all my stuff in here. Feature class equals LF meters like so. And let's say we want to reclassify that, but we're not sure what the, the existing range of values are. So I'm gonna do something here, um, which is to, to have a look at some of the properties. So if that's the feature class or the name, that's just the FC name, and then we'll make the raster variable and just call that FC, or let's not use FC for rasters, but rather RAS name. And I'll say RAS equals uh, arcpy dot raster. And then that'll be RAS name 
like so. That way I have the raster variable here. And I'm just gonna run this and then I'll check some of the properties of that raster variable. Just in my console, ras dot, and we have all these properties we could look at. Dimensions, functions, you know, has rat, get attribute variables, height, integer, multidimensional, mean cell, height, mean cell width. So let's get maximum. So the maximum value in my raster is 2,692 meters above sea level. And I'll say ras dot minimum is 1,834. So that's the range we can work within with this raster if we want to uh, reclassify it. First, I wanna check that my spatial analyst is imported. So I have all my spatial analyst functions imported. That way I can just call remap range by value. So I'll call this my remap object. And I'll say this is going to be a remap range. And then in here, I have to have a list. So that's my outer list. And inside will be individual lists. And I'll just do maybe three classes here. As an example, so I'm going to have three lists in here separated by, like so, separated by commas. And I just stub it out like that so I don't forget any brackets. And then I specify what I want to start with. So I'm going to, I don't have to start at 1834 for my minimum. I can just say from zero to, let's say, 2000. Let's make that zone one or elevation zone one. And then I'll say here from 2000 to 2500, change that to two. And then from 2500 to 3000, you know, notice here for that, I'm just going way over my maximum to make sure everything is included. And that will be a three. And so that's created now. I have a remap range object. Now I can actually apply a uh, reclassify function to this. So I could say, okay, let's reclassify now. RAS class, I'll call it RAS classified equals re classify and then in here which raster that'll be our grass the reclass field is almost always going to be value like that and then the remap object is our remap underscore obj like so And then I'll save this, RAS classified dot save, and I'll call it uh, LF reclass, like so. Then I'll run this. And now it's completed running. I don't see anything in here in the context of the console. So let's check this out in ArcGIS Pro. So let's go back over here to ArcGIS Pro. This is, by the way, the temperature layer that we created earlier. And I'm just going to go over here to my uh, catalog. And I'm going to refresh Sierra Nevada. And here I'll see my LF reclass, and I can bring that in just to have a look at it. And so those are now the zones. So one, two, and three. And generally I'd use one color for that. So a single color scale. So I go to appearance, symbology, classify, and I choose a single hue, like um, let's say something, uh, 
none of those ones. Something simple like that. Like so. So we got, it goes, just goes from very light blue to dark blue. Or it could have been red, but I might want to inverse that. So I'll go over here. Right there. More reverse symbol order. There we go. So dark blue will be mm, warmer and white is coldest in this particular zoning or reclassification of elevation. So that's how one of the classes of ArcPy um, works in the spatial analyst library. So it's a class that just creates value mapping. So it's called value maps or um, stuff like that that tells us what number ranges to go to what, not, to what new classification system. Then we have neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are used very frequently because one of the most used of all raster functions are neighborhood functions. And there's six different classes because we can have multiple types of neighborhoods. For example, any of these shapes up here are potential types of neighborhoods. And there's even custom ones that you can have where you specify your own type of what we would call filter. The most commonly used are these two, neighborhood rectangles and circles. So let's have a look at some of those in operation in ArcPy. So how they work. So we create a neighborhood rectangle class, for example, and these are usually square in size. So a nine by nine, means nine cells by nine cells. Um, a three by three is the most common. That means three cells by three cells or a nine cell neighborhood. So we're specifying the number of cells in X and number of cells in Y to make that, to make a particular neighborhood. Um, here in the example, right, on this graphic, we see a five by five neighborhood. And that just means that we have five things there. One, two, three, four, five cells by one, two, three, four, five. And the odd numbers are important. So um, three, five, nine, Etc., because it ensures that we have a symmetric neighborhood around the focal cell. And then all the values within the neighborhood here are, are used in some sort of summary computation. And then the center cell, the one, the focal cell for that neighborhood in the middle, oops, that takes on the summary value of the neighborhood values. And then the whole neighborhood moves one cell to the right. And then it would compute in here for that cell by having the neighborhood this like that way, like so. And then it would move over here until you'd have this part in, like so. And it does that for every cell. One thing with neighborhood functions like that, of course, is that when the neighborhood is at a corner of a cell like this, well, that'll be the size of the neighborhood. When it's on an edge, it would be, in, again, with a five by five, it would be like that. Like 
And so we don't see anything up here. And so there could be some biases along the edges of layers or rasters that are used in focal operations or neighborhood operations. And those biases are called edge effects. And they occur because you don't have as many values to compute the summary value as compared to when the neighborhood is within the main part of the raster around here. So for all the cells in here, they've got full neighborhoods, but along the edges, you no longer have full neighborhoods. And so you could potentially bias um, any data that you generate along the edges of the raster. So to create a neighborhood is straight, straightforward. And rectangle is the most common, as I said, and then for that followed by circle. Circles aren't pure circles, obviously, in raster, and they look like this. So the green cells represent a two circle or a two cell radius. So that's a two cell radius bit, bit, uh, shown with the green cells. And you can see it's not a perfect circle. The larger the radius, the more circular um, it becomes. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But with small circular neighborhoods, um, they look like that. They don't look like circles at all because you have um, obviously for two cell units, north, south, west, and east will have a full two cells, but two cell distance along the diagonal um, doesn't get way up here. So it, it's right about there, halfway. And so you only get those little cells uh, kind of in the um, north, 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 uh, north, northeast, or northeast, I should say northeast, southwest, southeast, and whatnot. So circles aren't perfect circles. And we always use cell as the measure of the distance, either for a rectangular or a circular neighborhood. And in our heads, we have to do the math to say, okay, what is the resolution of my layer? If it's 30 meters, for example, 30 meter resolution, then what would a um, two cell mean? Well, it'd be two times 30 equals 60 meters. So a two cell circle would have a radius of 60 meters. Likewise with a rectangular neighborhood, nine by nine will be 270 by 270. Uh, there's a 2700 by 2700, nine times 30. I think that's right. Yeah, my, I might put one, two extra. Yeah, I put an extra zero in there. Yeah, so I was right the first time, 270 by 270. And that would be the area, 270 meters times 270 meters equals um, squared 72,900 square meters. And that would be the size of that particular neighborhood in cell units. If you don't use cell units and you pick a particular distance, let's say, well, that distance could end up having a configuration like that just because it can't include full cells based on the distance that you choose. So we almost never choose distance as the units for creating neighborhoods for analyzing rasters. 
Um, here's a common example. So a common example would be to uh, take a raster that has a lot of, let's say, high detail in it or has noise in it and then average out that noise. So to decrease the um, high frequency variability. So here we start with a raster. We then create our neighborhood and this is a nine by nine, just like the previous example. And then we use these neighborhoods in focal statistics. So that's where they're used. And a focal statistic simply is the application of that neighborhood across each cell of the raster to derive new cells for the output. And in this case, we say the in raster is elevation, use neighborhood, which is the class neighborhood rectangle, and compute a mean and assign a mean value or average to each of the new output cells. And if you just look at the little, um, right up here at the, the graphic, so that's a part of a digital elevation model. And then when it's undergone the neighborhood rectangle, focal statistics, it looks like this. And so what you see is the disappearance of a lot of the detail, like watch just in here in this area. So I'll go back to the original. Now, after the neighborhood function has been applied. So it smooths out any fine detail. Original, you can see that over here as well. Smooth. And that can be um, important and used if you're looking at issues of scale, for example, to get things to the same scale as some other um, layer when you're talking about questions of scale, spatial scale and the effects on results. Smoothing can be one of the things that could be used to assess whether or not, um, you know, changing the, the resolution or scale of view has some effect on the output and sensitivity analysis, for example. So doing an example like that is pretty straightforward. So we don't have a remap range. We're not gonna use that or any of these. But we'll use the elevation in meters again, that one. So the RAS name is LF meters. And then I'm gonna create a neighborhood. So I'll say um, NBR, I'll just call it NBR equals NBR. And notice when I just type NBR, they all come up and I'll a circle and I'll use rectangle and be our rectangle. And I just need to specify the size in um, map units. So nine, 11 will be the next odd number, 11 by so that's an 11 by 11. And the units here, um, I, after the second 11, I put the units and those will be cell, like so. So that creates that neighborhood. So that little, little uh, set of 11 by 11 cells. Then we use it in focal statistics or neighborhood statistics, focal statistics. And I'll call the output here Um, smooth, let's call it smooth, equals focal statistics. And then we put our raster in, which is RAS. And then we need to just put our neighborhood next, which is NBR, and then the statistics type that we want. And again, there is mean, maximum, minimum, standard deviation, we just wanna have a mean filter like so. Then I'll save that. Say smooth.save and I'll call it, um, what's the input? Elev 11x11 like that to remind myself that that was an 11 by 11 smoothing. And then I'll run it. And we could check that out now in 
ArcGIS Pro. So I'll go back to Pro, go back to my catalog view. I'll refresh the catalog. And there's 11, 11 by 11. I'm just going to remove the two that are in there right now, just so we can compare. First, I'll bring in the original, which is 11 meters. So it looks like that. And then I'll bring in 11, 11 by 11, like that. And you can see it looks blurry, doesn't it? It's a smoothing filter. So a lot of the detail is lost. You know, we see like you can see these little stream um, uh, streams in here, and if I turn on the eleven by eleven, they disappear. So a lot of the small scale features are gone, and you have a more generalized elevation layer. So just swiping it, you can see that there. It's very. It's also very important to use these type of things often when you have noisy data, for example. So if there happens to be noise, that means a lot of erroneous um, measurements using a mean filter will decrease their influence visually and analytically, because when you take a bunch of uh, the mean of a bunch of things, you end up obviously with a more general number and greater generalization. For other data types, such as categorical data, where the numbers in the cells represent differences of kind, what we just did would not be an appropriate thing because we never treat numbers that represent categories numerically. That means we don't use addition, subtraction, multiplications, totals, sums, averages, standard deviations, or anything like that when a raster is categorical because none of those have any meaning to categories because the numbers that are representing categories are arbitrary, simply meaning that somebody chose the number 10, let's say to represent water and 10 is only used for water features. And then they chose, let's say 87 to represent agricultural land and five and 87 are just codes for different land cover types like you see here. So all oh, there's numbers in each of the cells just so that the numbers can differentiate between these categorical things in the legend. So that's not the same as continuous data. But there are some things we can look at that. Uh, so, for example, we could do focal varieties. This doesn't change what we have to do to the neighborhoods at all. We can use the same neighborhood definition for both continuous data and categorical data. But the statistic that we derive has to be different for categorical data like that. So we could look at variety, for example, how many different types of land cover occur within each um, neighborhood, uh, based neighborhood here being the neighborhood rectangle feature. Looking at an example like that, if I go here, back to our code, I'll change LF meters to, uh, first I'll, I'll get the names of the um, RAS names, because I can't remember all the names in the console here. Elevation land, so we'll do land cover because that's a categorical layer. So is ownership, could have chosen that. And soil, let's do soil. That's interesting. So I can keep my neighborhood rectangle. I keep focal statistics, but I have to change my input raster to soil, like so. And I have to change mean here to variety as an example. You could also use minority, which is the least frequent. 
and majority, which is the most frequent. These are all three things that are appropriate for data, which is categorical. And I'll save it under a different name. This will be um, soil richness. So computing soil richness instead this time, where richness is just a straight up measure of the number of different kinds of things within a nine cell or 270 meter by 270 meter region. So I'll run that. That's finished. I'll go and we can have a look at that in ArcGIS. So just going back to ArcGIS here, I'm going to refresh my Sierra Nevada so it shows up. And we'll open up the, I'm going to remove the elevation ones for now, or just uh, remove that. And remove that for now. Then I can bring in here, uh, where is it? Soil richness. And it ranges between one and seven. Seven means you have the most soil richness, the most different types of soil within that 270 meter region. So if I, if I just open the attribute table for this soil richness, I can select out seven. There's only a couple of pixels like that. There's not very many that have seven different kinds. So I wouldn't even be able to zoom into those or anything. And then so there, with six, there's not too many cells that have six different soil types within that 270 meters. Five, there's a bit more and they're highlighted up here now. So that's, that's five there that you can see it highlighted in light blue. Four, more of those. So many, there's a lot of the region that has four different soil types. This could be important to identify, uh, you know, if, they're, if you're looking at certain types of crops that you wanna grow in a region. Well, uh, the soil types, the mixture of soil types can you know, help you determine where you would want to do certain types of cropping and areas that you could crop multiple types of um, um, plants, for example, if there's a lot of soil types around. So you can help, help you, uh, you know, optimize where to put things. So that's a focal variety. And then if you just watch the little graphic up here, showing you on an Ottawa scale one, once the variety is applied, it looks like that, and then we have this new scale here. And that was just for land cover, land, or land, land use basically, or land cover. And that can be important, for example, you know, where there's more land cover within a small distance of each other, 270 meters, those can be uh, good areas for species richness. They can support maybe many different types of species, depending of course on how large those areas are. And you can also use this to define or find where there are ecotones. And that's the transition between different types of communities, vegetation communities or ecological communities in space. Uh, NumPy or NumPy. Now, if you don't have access to spatial analysts, and you're working in a limited licensed environment, then NumPy can be your best friend because most of the things that you can do with the tools that are within ArcPy Spatial Analyst, you can do a lot of that with NumPy itself by converting your rasters to NumPy arrays. Since a raster, as you see here, is just an array of numbers. Each cell contains a value and each cell has an address. The addresses are things being shown here. Each cell has an address and in each cell there is a number and that's all that they are. Computers are very fast, especially NumPy for Python is very fast at working with um, arrays of numbers. 
because that's kind of how computers are structured to work with these really well, matrices, for example. And to convert any raster, we use the raster to NumPy array function that's built into ArcPy. So it's not at the spatial analyst level of licensing. It's at the regular ArcPy level of licensing that we convert to NumPy arrays. And then we get back a two-dimensional two array of rows and columns. And the order after that is different. So once you convert a raster to a NumPy array, then we reference things by row first and then column second. So that's something to keep in mind. Whereas in ArcGIS, in the most GIS systems, rasters are uh, column row. So your reference would always be, okay, I want column one, row two, the value there. In NumPy, the same thing would mean row two, column one. But to remember here, NumPy structure is the same as a raster. It just doesn't have all the things that go along with rasters, the, you know, all those properties and methods that rasters carry around. So a NumPy array is a very lightweight stripping out, strips out all the properties and methods of a regular raster and just contains the values in a two-dimensional structure, like a spreadsheet structure. Here's an example of converting. So elevation, for example, we can convert to a NumPy array. And when we do convert to NumPy arrays, it's good to set this parameter to an argument, no data to value equals negative nine, 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 nine. This number must be some number, any number that you're gonna remember. So these are the properties, one, any number, you will remember. And two, a number that definitely does not occur in the raster being converted. And why those two things are important? Well, because you have to work with, when you're working with NumPy arrays, you want to be able, you have to be able to specify which values of the array shouldn't be looked at or considered when doing computations with the array. And every raster in ArcGIS has no data values in it. And so, we don't see them in ArcGIS. Just going back here to refresh your memory. So right now, right, right now with a, this raster here, the soil richness. Let me get, I'm gonna close this table so I can get more room there. Let's zoom to it this way. So I'm gonna go to the appearance of that. Symbology, open that up. And no data right now is transparent, but I'm gonna make the no data just pure black. Wow, and suddenly you see that this is a rectangular raster because all rasters are rectangular, they have to be. Um, we just don't see it when, when the rectangular area, the parts of the full rectangular area are by default no color like that. So we see what looks like a slightly um, rotated soil richness map, but it's not in fact, in it's native coordinate system. Um, we can see that it's, uh, I'll make it maybe dark red there. I'll make it black. The black cells are just have no data in them. And that no data is a value. Usually the largest or the smallest value for the numeric data type being used to represent values within the cells. And so when we convert a raster to a NumPy array, the array is a re fully rectangular array that you'll see here, which is just a including the black and everything else. 
And so NumPy sees the array as had, will have numbers in there by default. By default, if you don't specify what the no data value should be in the NumPy array, the no data value that is specified for this data type in our GIS is transferred over. And it's a big number to type out. So it's easier to type just some number that you know will, oops, that you know will be okay for representing the no data in the NumPy array, something easier to work with like that. Why negative 999? Well, if I look at here, I can see my values only go from one to seven. So there's no way that in this particular raster that there is going to be a negative 999, nine or whatever occurring. And that's raster dependent, obviously, depends on what your raster is representing. So negative 999 wouldn't be appropriate all the time if that's within the range of values that are being um, used within a raster. So you have to look at the values and you saw how I did that earlier by looking at the maximum and minimum values of the raster. And then you can choose something outside that range. So again, for this one, I'll just do it in the console here. Pretending I don't have ArcGIS open or anything. So I'll say my, my, my new raster, I'll say, is, I'll just call it x equals arcpy.raster. And this will be cover. So, so now I can say x dot minimum print print x dot minimum. None maximum print x dot minimum. The issue is that my original, when I was doing x dot minimum and y dot minimum and getting none, just for the raster object called x, and same thing if I was to do it again here, x dot minimum says nothing is returned, even when I print it. And that's because there's no statistics calculated for that. So I have to import from Arc, ArcPy, I dot management, let's say import all here. I'll say calculate statistics for my um, variable, which was X. So now if I say X dot max, maximum, gives me that and X dot minimum gives me that here. So these range between 11 to 71 or 71 and 11. And knowing that range, then I could say, okay, well, I could use 72 if I wanted to as my no data value when converting from raster to NumPy array, or I could use zero since neither of those numbers are within the range of cell values for the land cover data set. However, it's usually more important or more common to use something like this, a negative, a negative number if everything is positive. It's like negative 9999, um, for example, for the elevation. Um, you know, I could decrease that so I have less to, less to type, but something like that is the best one to use but you first again have to check the minimum and max, maximum and minimum values for a given raster to know what one to use. And you may know that you can look, you could look at it in ArcGIS Pro or you could do it the way I did here is to just use the properties maximum and minimum of a raster object. And if none is returned, nothing comes up, then you have to use the calculate statistics. So we'll have everything the same up here. And I'm going to take land cover this time, like so. Then I make a raster out of it. And then from this point on, it'll be a bit different. So I'll say lcov, that'll be my numpy array, equals arcpy raster to t 
to numpy array. And then in here, it's pretty straightforward. I put my raster, ras, and then no data to value equals. And since I know the range um, small, and I'll say equals nine, negative 90, nine, nine, like that. So then I'll run that. And now Elkov here is a, looks like this. I can type that and you'll see what the, just briefly what it looks like. So it's a NumPy array. And you see it starts with negative nine, nine, nines in there. It's not showing us the whole array or anything, just a bit from the beginning and a bit from the end of it. But it's a giant two dimensional array. Once we have a NumPy array, we can access the cell values according to the column and row coordinate system. For example, here, you see NP array, and we're asking for row 133, column 100. So that's the 134th number or row and the 101th, not a very good 101, um, column. And that's because we start at zero counting, of course. And you can see here in uh, PyScriptor, we show the Elkov, the array as such, and NumPy arrays have a number of ways we can get uh, information of them. And the first one I was showing was saying, okay, Elkov, what's the value at um, 133, 100? That's 42. However, if I said, okay, what is the value at of the 34th row and second column, like so, then you'd say Elkov 33, which is the 34th row and the second column, which is row one. So it's n minus one in that case. And that would give me that value there. So knowing how to find the values depends on how the column and row questions are um, specified. So if we're asking for the 130, you know, the 35th, 34th row and second column, what we mean is this, Elkov 33, one. If we're just saying, what is the value at a row and column coordinate, then you specify or just put in the row and column coordinate as asked. So it depends what's being asked for. You to be very careful reading those type of things so you know that you're getting the right value or not. Now, NumPy has a number of different properties and methods that go along with the array. All of these ones go along with the array. So there's, there's you know, some 30 plus different properties or methods. So a common one is size and shape. So if you look at size here, I could say Elkov.size. And it shows us the size in, um, of, or the number of uh, uh, values in there. Uh, Elkov.shape. That gives us the number of rows and columns within this raster. Um, Elkov dot max, Ooh, method max, like so, gives us the highest value. Now, if I say Elkov dot min, what value do you think will come up? Probably this value. In, there we go. And so that comes up and that's not a real value. That's a no data value. 
So we'd have to fix that. We'd have to say LCOV, and then open um, square brackets, LCOV not equal to negative 999. dot min and it comes in at 11. So notice what I did here is I sliced oops, control, uh, like that. I sliced Elkov saying that I don't I only want from Elkov values that are not negative 999 to be considered. And so this statement creates a new um, a new um, uh, a new array a new numpy array for then i ask for the minimum of that there so that's almost like an sql type of statement in there but here we're using um relational operators to in, to exclude a particular value from the computation of the minimum there's cumulative sums all kinds of really useful uh methods and properties. So in this example, again, I have a new array, numpy array, and I say not equal that. So I get, I get rid of that to start with, and then I can work with the array, as you saw, to get the, the minimum max mean, mean and standard deviation we didn't see here. So I would use the previous one to get mean and standard deviation. Dot mean. And there's the average. And again, it was important here that I use the one that excludes the negative 999, the no data values. Otherwise, I would get this. A very different value being wrong, of course, because it's this low simply because of the negative 9999s that are still in that raster that represent no data. And standard deviation, same thing. I'll just go up here, use my up there. And I can say, okay, dot SD, TD, STD. And that deviation of the values in the NumPy array. So you see some of these are similar to, uh, you know, what you can do with functions in Python with plain old lists. If you want to get something like the unique values that are in the entire thing, well, you can get it this way. So in a raster, if we want to know what the unique values are, if it's categorical, well, we can convert something like land cover, which we've already done. And then we can use the numpy unique function right here and transform that to a list instead of a array. So just for an example, to see all the different values that would be in the legend, I can say numpy.unique. And then I can put in here my LCOV. And that looks like that. So it's an array. And I could say that, okay, dot two list or two list. Or what do we call it there? Two, oh, all small. Two list. So, so just a different, if you want to work with them, for example. And of course, negative 999 is in there. If instead I said, okay, LCOV to list like that. And I say LCOV in here in the unique function, LCOV, and then LCOV not equal to negative 999 to list. Oh, wrong, not equals. Let's see, not equal to like so. And then we get just all of the unique values that represent differences of kind within the raster layer. So I fix that to the proper not equals to for Python 3.0.
So we have to make sure to use that type of not equals uh, to make these things work. So we can also write a NumPy array to a text file. And this is just for fun. So here, for example, I get my NumPy array, I create it, and then I iterate over all the values making and write it out to a text file, usually uh, row by row. So I'll open a CSV file. So I'll call my file CSV because things will be separated by commas within the rows. And it will be for write as file. And then I go for row, for one row. So for each row, then the entire column is written out for that row. So I'm doing row and then each column in the row is written out. And I only write when it's not negative 999. Of course, I could make that easier on myself and not include negative 999 in it altogether, but I'm gonna write blanks, basically, blank, um, blank um, strings, nothing in them, every time there's a negative 999, otherwise I'll just write out the true value that's found at the cell. And then when I'm finished, I'll have a text file um, of all the values in the raster that I could bring into other software, even Excel, for example. You'll also see here, and I'll explain it, you'll see it again when I do the example, that I get the row range from shape zero, because remember the shape, um, the shape property, of the NumPy array gives us the number of columns followed by the number of rows. So I'm getting this from the shape, the index position zero, which is the number of rows. And then here, index position one for shape, which is the number of columns. So I have my LCOV here. Then I'll open, I'll start with, by opening my file, I'll say open, um, C, Temp, that's where I'll put it, um, myras.csv, I'll just call it that, for writing as F. So I open the file up. Um, let's give me a syntax error here, I'm not sure why. Oh, four. That's all there is F. Probably something right something down here. So then I'll iterate over my NumPy array, LCOV. So I'll say for row in range LCOV dot shape zero, zero uh, minus one. Then for call, Per column in range lcov shape one. That's the columns minus one. Then I can say f dot write. For example, just to write them out with all the values to start with is an easy way to look at it. F dot write. Um, and then I'll put in uh, quotes, squiggly brace comma, dot format. Elkov dot Elkov row call, like so. I'm still getting that open. Oh, oh, is it open? No. I'm trying to figure out why I'm getting a syntax error in the open. I'll just run it to see what that is. And I notice I just forgot the width here. So width open. And I'm getting another one down here for call in range. Let's just see what that one is about. I forgot my, just the colon. So that was all right. So there it read it out. And I'll go over and have a look at it in the temp folder where I saved it. It is myras.csv. And if I double click on that, it's associated with that with Excel. So it's just going to open up in Excel. Right now it looks like that. So it just gives all the values in a single row. 
And that's not what we want to see because that's not two dimensional, is it? That's one dimensional. So we just to see if it would work, we did that. Um, and I'm just thinking here that we don't need these actually because when we use the range function, range always goes to n minus one where n is this. And so that's minus one. So once we do that, and we also need to fix this so we get them on each row. So after each uh, column is written, then I'll say um, f dot right, and it'll just be a new line character. So I'll run it again. That's done and we can check it out, my RAS. And here we can see then all the numbers, negative 999s and everything like that. But we, would, we don't want the negative 999s in there because that's just no data. So we'll go back and we'll say, okay, instead of writing everything, we'll say, if Elkov row call does not equal negative 999, then write it. So I need to put that indented here. Else, F dot write just a blank, nothing, just a blank space, but basically just a comma, like so. I don't have to use a dot format statement with that. So I'll run it again. Now we'll open it up in Excel and have a look at it. We won't see those negative 999s. So wherever there was a negative 999, it's gone. You can see here, that just represents blank cells. Now, if I make those cells smaller, like so, and then I go to conditional formatting, color scales, for example, that, and I just zoom out, I'll start to see what looks like a raster. Oops, I have to zoom out quite a bit. And that looks exactly like the raster we see in ArcGIS. I don't think you can zoom out anymore. Um, where's my zoom? And maybe those rows, all of, or not that row, but all of them. Then I'll zoom to 10%. There we go. And so now you can see, it looks a lot like the raster did in ArcGIS Pro. I'll just go back to ArcGIS Pro, show the land cover. Different colors, of course, but you get the same idea of the shape and everything. And that's just because it's showing the values of the cells within the raster. And I've colored them according to their magnitude. So it's, it's just a neat little thing to show that you could then, you know, send that data to somebody else and they could utilize that data itself in Excel if they don't know any other type of software and they wanna know stuff about raster properties or elevations or do things with those. So that's the example which I just showed you. And then how I'm just zooming out more and more gives you a raster. This is a different raster, obviously, than the one we're using, but you get the idea. So with NumPy as well, we can do all most map algebra operations that we would need to do. Here we have an example. We have NumPy being imported and we set our workspace, the raster we want to do something with, and this will be the control raster as well for any analyses uh, that use uh, tools which are part of the spatial analyst package. So our standard ones, we went through those earlier. We'll need to go through them again, the environment settings. These become important because we're also gonna learn how to 
convert a NumPy array back to a raster with a coordinate system in ArcGIS Pro. So we need to have those environments set. So when we do that, it works properly. So NumPy has a number of conditional functions that are specific to it. If you have spatial analyst, for example, you can just say raster less than or equal to this, raster greater than that and whatnot to get, to create Boolean layers or whatever to get outputs. With NumPy arrays, you have to use the NumPy equivalents called the NumPy logical and uh, relational operators. So for example, here, I have my no data value and I just specify that as a variable because that could change based on the raster. So using negative nine, 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 nine here, and knowing the data, of course, I know that that's well outside the range of any of the values of the raster. So I convert it to a NumPy array specifying the no data value as that, negative nine, 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 nine. I then make a copy, and this is really important when you're working with NumPy rasters in that um, you often want to have a full copy of the original so that you can later use its no data values as a mask to superimpose upon any of the computations you do with NumPy arrays. So I keep a, a original copy just as a mask layer. That's like setting the mask property for environment settings when you're working with spatial analyst functions. Then I hear I'm just converting using a map algebra statement to convert the elevation. So I'm using the original elevation in this example to meters. So I have elev here. Elev is now a raster variable in Python, a Python raster variable. Then I want to figure out where values of elevation are greater than 2000 and less than 3000. And I want to specify those as being one, the value one. And so you'll see here I have elev, which is the name of the raster right here. And then I'm using the slicing operators, the square brackets. So one here and one here. And then I have to say in there, not, so I want elevation, which is not greater than 2000 and less than 3000. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, okay, give me all the elevation that is not between 2000 and 3000 and set all those cells as one. Next, with the same array that's been processed up here, because it changes it, I say, and. So I say elevation greater than 2000 and less than 3000 is two. So what I've done here is set a value of one everywhere where the elevation is not between my specified elevation and I give it a single value. So since I want, and again here, I want elevations between 2000 and 3000. And so I have to say, okay, um, find the elevations between 2000 and 3000, and then basically invert that with a logical knot to select all other elevations outside that range and set those as one. And then these elevations aren't affected. So then I have one as a value in the raster, as well as elevations within this range as values. So now I turn my attention to that and I say, okay, elev, or change elev using NumPy logical n, everything greater than 2000 or less than or equal to 3000 and make it a two. And so that then gives me the number two to represent <clears throat> the elevation range I want. But I have to first get rid of the ones I don't want and set them to a one first. So the steps are a little bit more intricate here, but you can get the, achieve the same result. Finally, I set the no data value to 
back and I say lev mask equals no data value. So wherever in the mask, there's a no data value, set it to the no data value. Because when I do these things up here, this includes all values, including the no data value. And so I want to get that back because we know where there's no data, there's no data. We don't want to have a one where there's no data originally. And so that's why this step is necessary right here to take the original copy and say, wherever that copy has the no data value, also make my elev here have no data, overwriting all the ones that would be there. And in terms of other NumPy functions that we have available to us, we have NumPy logical and, which we used here, and not, so we have the not and the and, there's also OR and XOR, so you can use those as well in doing basic uh, map algebra with relational and conditional operators. Masking out those ones is important where they were should be no data, so we do that. Then, once we have our ref or our output NumPy array, we now want to convert that NumPy array into a ArcGIS bona fide raster and save it. And to do so, we need to get a couple things. We need to have an extent, the lower left point. So what's the lower left point of our raster? So we create an ArcPy point, a point um, object. Remember, that's not a point geometry object, which is a point. And we get that from our original xmin and y min from the extent of our elevation raster. So it's just because we say they're, they're all the same size, right? We haven't changed the size of anything. So the bottom left corner is the same for both the NumPy array and for original raster. So we do that first, then we look at the cell size and we get the cell size, the original cell size to specify that our NumPy raster cell size is the same because that hasn't changed. But we, you know, a NumPy raster has no idea of cell size, no concept of cell size. And then we create the new raster object using ArcPy NumPy array to raster. So it's the inverse of what we did to get to the NumPy array. So we, to get the NumPy array, we go, um, a raster to NumPy array. And to go back, we need to go to NumPy array to raster. And in there, then I put my 11, and I give a type to it as well as integer. Since I only have integer values, one and two, I put the lower left cell, the cell size, and the value to no data being the NDV, the no data value. Once I have that, my new RAS here, then I save it. And that's how we deal with a NumPy array. So let's try that. It's a lot of steps and you need a lot of exposure to it to understand this type of process. So we'll start back up with our previous one here and we'll go through that. And we saw how we could write stuff, so that's fun. Get rid of that. We already have our environment settings set to the, um, the first raster, the elevation raster, so that's fine. We have our checkout extension, everything is good there. Our raster name this time is going to be elevate elevation. I think elevation meters we'll use, and I'll just uh, make sure we got the spelling of that right. I'll say RAS names. Last time I run it, uh, there's it's 11, 11 meters, yeah. Or no, we want to use the elevation. Because the purpose of this was to show how to, one of the things was a map algebra statement in there. So we have that, and then we make RAS into a, RAS name goes here into the raster 
function to get a raster variable. And then we get a um, NumPy array. So I'll call that um, input RAS. Or no, how about um, a lev input or original, like so. And we'll convert it again using the negative 999 because we know that's not in the range. Then I'll make um, a copy of that mask equals a lev original dot copy. Like so, so that's safe there. And then I'll make a lev, a new one here, just lev equal to lev original times point three zero four eight. So we make a copy because we need to save the copy because it has all the original information in it from lev original right here. And that just makes sure that we have a copy stored in memory somewhere else as a, as a raster variable that will not, not be affected by any changes that we make to this one. And then I make a lev here, and it's lev original times 0 0.3048 divided into meters. Now, what I want to do, I want to find uh, all you know, show all locations, cells between 2,000 and 3,000 meters above sea level, like so. To do so, I modify my 11 and I say 11, and then open um, brackets for slicing. And then I'm going to say NumPy. Dot lot. I don't. I didn't. I don't think I even um had NumPy up here. Yeah, you got to import NumPy. So, and I'll import. I say from ArcPy. In, no, sorry. Import NumPy. So that's a library by itself there. So once I have that imported, I'm just gonna run this temporarily. To make sure that's imported and I can see the uh, options come up. That's great. So I'll have here, I can say numpy dot logical or no numpy dot, um, I think it's math dot logical. No, numpy, oh, let's go back check. Numpy dot logical dot, and then in parentheses, numpy dot logical and then in parentheses here, the values in commas, 2000 and 3000. And I want to assign that, right? So this is all one um, slicing of elevation right here. So I'm saying not, so for all cells that are not between two and 3000, assign them a value of one. So that modifies 11, everything that's not between those two values will become a number one. Then I go back in to 11. And here I'm going to say just a num numpy logical and numpy dot logical and 2000, 2000 to 3000, like so. And that's greater, that's um, um, including those values. And I say that equals um, two. Ah, but I forgot to put in the, the, the uh, uh, relational operators here. So anything, greater than 2000 
or greater than 3000 or less than I should say. And that will be LF greater than 2000 and LF less than 3000. So that's our in between thing. We just need those down here then like so. But here we want greater than or equal to or less than or equal to like so. So I had forgotten to put those in. I was just putting the commas to start. And then I went back and filled them in with the name of the thing and the relational operator um, greater than and less than. And then down here, greater than equal to, less than equal to 3000. So it includes those as a two. Then the next thing I'm going to do is apply my mask now, because remember, even the no data values up here, negative 999, we'll get a one in this statement because here we're saying anything that is outside of that range, we'll get a one and that includes no data values. So now we wanna, we put our mask in and the no data value for that. And I, I didn't specify that up here. So I'll just specify the NDV as well equals negative 999. And I could just uh, up here, put that in there. No data value NDB, wherever it's needed. Instead of typing out negative 999 every time, this way I can change it if I need to for another data set that might include that within its range of data. Then I'm gonna say LF. And here it's gonna be the uh, mask. equals negative or equals NDV like so. Um, and the mask, wherever the mask, LF mask equals NDV. So in elevation, wherever the mask, which is the same size is equal to the no data value then assign the no data value to elevation, like so. So if I just run that right now, and then I just look at elev so far, it'll show me, again, what I hope to see, negative nine, nine, nines in the beginning and near the end because of the uh, no data values. Next, we'll go and we'll output elev into a brand new raster in ArcGIS. So that's what we're doing in the thing here. So first we use our original raster to get the extent min and max and put it into ArcPy point and call it lower left. And then the cell size, lower left equals ArcPy dot point. And this will be elev original dot extent dot x min like that and elev original dot extent dot y min and that's the bottom left corner so we now have the bottom left corner in this variable called lower left, which contains an arcpy point. And next, I need to get to the other line here. So I have to go to the end of this line. The next thing we need to do is to get the cell size. So I'll call just call this cell size. And that will be equal to, um, again, the elev, elev original dot mean cell width like so. Now I can go ahead and convert this to a new spatial data raster layer. And so I'll say, um, I'll just give it, an, I'll save the output anyway uh, as a result object. So let's say um, 11 new equals ArcPy 
numpy array to raster. And then in here, um, the first thing is the array, lf. And then the lower left corner, which is lower left. So, and then the cell size, which is cell size. And then we say, um, here we'll say value to no data. We'll say that's equal to negative or NDV or no data value. I'll put that on a couple lines there so you can see it. So that then creates a raster variable, which we now need to save. I love new. Dot save, and I'll call this. Um, uh, this is the condition, so um, I'll call this a what condition will put. I'll just call it uh, lev out put, like so. Then I'll give it a run. Oops. Oh, of course, yes. I here in point and in cell size, I was using 11 original, which is a numpy array, whereas I actually want to use the uh, raster RAS because RAS is a actual ArcGIS raster variable and not a numpy array. So I can't get an extent from a numpy array because it doesn't mean anything. So here I'll have uh, for these ones RAS. RAS and down here, RAS. I mean, cell width, and I'll give that a run. So that ran successfully. So now, if I go back to my ArcGIS, and I'll just refresh Sierra Nevada, I should see that here. Um, and I called it, um, what did I call it? LF output, LF output right there. So I can drag it in. And it has a one and a two in it only. And it drained it, it, it brought it in as a, so I made a mistake here. There's the one thing I forgot. So here, LF output was brought in and it shows just all black, but it shows in the legend here a one and a two. And those are the only values in this thing. But the problem was, or the problem is that um, it brought it in as a floating point raster. So if I look at the source here, uh, band metadata, raster information, columns, rows, compress size, generic, and it brought in the pixel type is double precision. So that's a floating point raster, 64-bit floating point raster in that, in fact. So yes, I could still use it and I could go to my appearance, symbology. I could say discrete and something like that. There we go. So that, that's what it would look like. But obviously I want it to be not like that. I want it to come in as an integer raster. So uh, what I want to do here then is say as type int, so like that. So to convert the numpy array to a um, regular integer numpy array, you just have to just as type, the as type method of the array as int. So now if I run that, and I don't have overwrite output equals true yet, so I'll just put A on there. I'll have output A to show you the difference. Run it again. There we go. So going back to here, if I go to my catalog, refresh, and there's a lev output A. Now when I bring that in, it should look as two colors automatically like so with value one and two. So all the one values are less than 2000 or greater than 3000. All the two values are between 2,000 and 3,000 meters above sea level.
so that's one way we can work with NumPy arrays. It's just a simple example. Once you have NumPy arrays, you can work with them as you would rasters. So two or three NumPy array, NumPy arrays could be used in a map algebra statement, for example. So for next week, uh, read chapter 10 in Zanbergen or 18 in uh, Teotesian's book and complete exercise five.